Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of A God Shift. I'm your host, Shana Rattler. I am so glad that you're here today. But before we get started, I would love if you would do me a favor. So wherever it is that you're listening to this episode, I want you to take a screenshot of that episode, post it on your social media, tag us here at A God Shift. And I just want to hear your biggest aha moment or your biggest takeaway from these episodes, not because I really care about the number of downloads, but what I really do care about is that I recognize that there are a lot of believers that really want to do their part in upholding and protecting Christian values, and they just don't know where to start. So the more times that these episodes are shared, the more people that can be equipped with the strategies and the tips and the tools that my guests share. So thank you so much in advance for share, share, sharing the episode. Well, I'm going to read my guest bio and we're going to get started with what I know is going to be a great conversation. Um, we've had to reschedule this twice. So I think that <laughs> means the enemy is trying to stop us from having a very, very much needed conversation. Yeah. So my guest today is a certified neuro coach, certified professional life coach, speaker, Bible teacher, and author who has a book coming out in the fall of 2024. She empowers women with brain science and faith-based tools to break free from negative thought patterns for more peace and confidence. I want to welcome to the show, Alicia Michelle. Hey, so glad to be here. I am so glad that you're here. I'm so excited to hear more about this topic because I've had people that have reached out to me in the past and they've asked to be on my show and they want to talk about different types of neurological things. They want to talk about different brain things, but they're not necessarily Christians. They're not tying it into Christianity. Sometimes I've actually been a little concerned whether or not it may be like anti-Christian topics. And so when I met you and I learned more about what it is that you do, and I've done more research for you on this, I'm really excited to see how you blend the two, how you say, okay, this is the way that the brain works. This is the way that God designed it to. And I'm going to blend that with all things Christianity to get yes. people more peace and confidence, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm so excited about this conversation. Yes. So, Alicia, my audience is primarily leaders. Mm -hmm. And these are leaders who are looking for ways that they can use the influence and authority that they already have to protect and uphold our Christian values that are really attempting to be eroded at everywhere that we look. Right. And so when you think about a leader who is having to have tough conversations, when you have a leader that is looking to do something that can sometimes be daunting, how is it that we can actually learn to control our emotions? And why is that so important? Why is managing our emotions so important? I think that's the question I want to ask first. Wow. Well, I think the biggest answer to that question is besides the peace that we can have when we learn how that skill of managing our emotions, the biggest issue is, of course, there is an eternal impact to what we do with all of our actions. And if we have things like, emotions, whether that's fear, shame, disappointment, whatever, getting in the way, then we are limiting almost like, um, if you have, I can't think of what those are called, oh, a damper. If you have like a, a horn or a trumpet and you put a damper on the end of it, like we can have a message, but if we have these things that are blocking the full expression of that message, or we feel hindered in some way from doing what God wants us to do, then that's a problem. So we absolutely need to learn skills to be able to understand what's happening in our minds, to hear these emotions that are happening, but to not be afraid of them from the point of, I feel like there's two extremes. We're either shutting them down and telling ourselves like we were wrong to feel this way. We should never feel like this, or we're completely indulging ourselves in them and letting them rule the show. So there is a happy medium. There is a middle ground. And I feel like Jesus is in that middle ground, thankfully. So we can begin to learn these skills and we can dig into some of the practical ways to do that in this conversation. But I feel like it's not something that's taught. It's not something that is, is taught just in general in society. And it's certainly not something that's taught in the church about what do we do when we feel these things and why it's important to move forward? Because it absolutely is. And I can only imagine that for you to have created an entire business around this and you're writing books and you have an award-winning podcast and all of these things, that means that this issue is both persistent and pervasive. You're coming yeah. across it all the time. Yes. And so why is it so common, especially amongst women? 
think that we tend to just be emotional creatures in general as humans. And of course, as women, we have all the extra added things in there, like just changing life seasons, um, just hormones, all the different things that we're having. And as women, we have a lot of us, the pressures of motherhood and, and being a good wife. And also many of us work as many of your audience do if they're leaders, like we have all these pressures that maybe men don't have. And so I think when we have these pressures and we don't know what to do with them, we come up with our own dysfunctional ways to deal with them. And yeah. I mean, our brain is so smart. It's going to figure out ways to release that, that steam, so to speak, if we're like building up steam in a pot, it's going to find ways to release that steam. And so we find ourselves doing these dysfunctional behaviors, like all the different coping mechanisms of, of maybe turning to food or, or turning to scrolling on our phone or shopping or drinking or all the different things because our body is like, I need a release. I need to be able to get rid of this. And so it's so important that we can begin to say, all right, I'm going to notice, I'm going to slow down enough to begin to notice what's happening in my head. That's the, absolutely the first step. We have to be able to learn how to see what's there and not look at it from a judgmental standpoint or from um, a way to just condemn ourselves, but to look at it with curiosity, almost like a scientist and to, to begin to notice some patterns of when is it happening? Why is it happening? Huh, that's interesting that I feel this every single time I'm around this person or every single time of, at this point in the day or whenever this situation comes up, I notice myself tending towards wanting to go hide in, in doing these other little projects around the house or wanting to go over here and, and avoid that person. And we have to notice what is there and what's going on. And so that's kind of the first step is being able to be quiet enough and disciplined enough to notice what's happening and then to bring it before God and say, okay, help me to begin to see what some, what are the patterns here? Because I want you to help me create a different response because only when we can see what's there, can we, can we actually have a different response? And he's the one who can help us see it and to help us come up with a plan for something different. I love that you talked about how as women, especially women leaders, that there's all these things that we have to do by default. Like we're a mm -hmm. mom, we're a wife, we're mm -hmm. a leader, we're a this, we're a that. We wear all of these different hats. But I almost think that sometimes if we are having um, an, a tough time emotionally in our lives, that rather than to do exactly what it is that you just said do, like figure out like, What's triggering me? Why am I having this response? Why is this coming up? How can I find some more healthy ways to kind of manage that? We actually just pile on more things to do. Absolutely. And then we right. wonder why we're so drained and why we're so tired. Well, because think about it, especially if you're a leader, like you and I are leaders. So what is giving us that satisfaction? What keeps us going often is more accolades, more checks on the to-do list. And so just recently I did a, a reel about this because it seems like that's the biggest lie of being overwhelmed and exhausted is we're just going to keep doing more things to get the things off the list when yeah. that's actually the absolute opposite of what we need to be doing. Sometimes we have to just say, I mean, not that we have to, we have to stop everything. I mean, let's be realistic. We do need to get stuff done. That's just part of life. We have to get things done, but there are times when the answer to feeling the relief of overwhelm and exhaustion is not to keep pushing. It's to stop and to say, what are ways that I can be filled up now so that I can do more? What are ways that I can get that replenishment from the Lord and, and not just even spiritual replenishment, but physical replenishment, emotional replenishment, what's going on with me where I'm more than just this machine that's performing and doing and, and accomplishing Yes, there is a satisfaction and, and um, a relief that comes in doing good things, especially yeah. things for God, but there has to be that input in order to have quality output. And so we have to stop and be aware enough of ourselves to notice when that's happening. One of the things that I um, always want to make sure that I'm mindful that the people that are in my camp are equipped to do, because if you're in my camp, if you're listening to this, this episode, if you're anywhere in the ecosystem of a God shift. You're here because you want to share Jesus. You're here because you are looking for ways to speak out of all of the forms of opposition to God, you know, that we're seeing all around the world. And I know how we are as women, especially as women, men may deal with this too, but especially as women, we may tend to overthink it 
Mm. Or even worse, we may feel that we're unqualified because we, we may feel qualified to do the thing that the, that the word leader is attached to. But now that they're stepping up and saying, no, I want to stake it. I want to take a stand for Jesus. I want to share the love of Jesus with people. I want to show people how the lives that they're living or the things that they're doing um, is actually in opposition to what it is that God desires them to do. How do we break free from that feeling of overthinking it to the point that it keeps us stuck or us actually feeling disqualified in order to be able to do that? Mm. Overthinking is huge. So many of us get stuck in that. And I think we are in a time frame of the world where there is so much being bombarded in our minds that our minds are continually in a state of receiving and overthinking and analyzing and just processing. And so we have to make times, first of all, to stop and intentionally find a place for our mind to just stop processing, whether that's sitting outside in the quiet for 10 minutes, setting a timer sometimes is what I have to do. It's just, I feel the thoughts come in and I just have to, I have to play certain little games with myself. Like seeing a thought come in, if I haven't written it down, which I, I do, I'm like, okay, fine, write it down and then you can let it go. But if it still keeps coming up, then it's like, I'll play a game where I'm like, all right, I see that thought. And then it's just like, I close a door in front of it, or I put it in like, put it in my hand and I lift it up to God. Like it's gone. I don't have to deal with it right now, but we have to learn how to stop. We have to learn how to stop the thoughts when they're, yeah. when they're just going crazy like that. So that's kind of in the motion, in the moment kind of stuff. But when we are also finding ourselves in patterns where we're overthinking about that big thing, right. That we know God's calling us to do, but we're like, uh, that is the presence of fear. Yeah. And one of the best explanations that I've found in understanding fear is understanding two words from the Bible that are Hebrew words that describe fear. The first one is Pachad, P-A-C-H-A-D. The second one is Yura, Y-I-R-A-H. So I'm sure I'm slaughtering how you say that in Hebrew, but these are two different ways that the Bible describes fear. So Pachad fear are those kind of fears that we want to pay attention to. Those are danger fears. Like it's probably a good idea to not drive hundred miles an hour on the freeway in a snowstorm. It's just not wise. Right. So that's a fear. If we have that fear, good, good. Listen to it. You don't want to have that. Right. But then there is this Yura kind of fear. And this is the expansive kind of feeling that we have when we know that we are being called into something beyond what we are right now. Yes. And it's like that that feeling that we're like, oh, but what if, and I don't know if I can, that feeling of where we have to trust God to get into that next step, into that next season, that is the kind of fear that we lean into. So if we can learn to differentiate between, is this a Picard fear that I need to listen to, that I just want to like, you know, it's probably not wise for me to do that. Or is this really a Yura fear where it's, yeah, it's it, sure there's risk. Absolutely. There's risk and we're going to be uncomfortable and it's a, it's something that we can lean into. So sometimes I equate this to if women who are listening have gone through labor and given birth, that feeling of when you're going through labor, there is a difference in the pain of a sharp, this hurts. I need to stop. Like something's going on versus the contraction that is opening up your body to release the baby. That's something we want to lean into. That's a healthy kind of bigger than me thing that I need to just let happen. And so when I began seeing that difference in fear, it just, it really helped me to recognize that I, most of the time, as I think it's true for most of us, most of the time, the fears that I'm feeling are the Yura fear. And yeah. that is when I can grab Jesus's hand and say, all right, I see you calling me to this. So help me get to the other side. He is that bridge to carry us through the Yura fear. He understands it. He sees it. He's okay with the presence of it. It's an invitation to bring him into it. So going back to overthinking, if we find ourselves in those kind of places, we have to ask, is fear underneath it? And then we can begin to figure out, is it the kind of fear we need to listen to and probably pay attention to? Or is it the kind of fear that we need to lean into and let God help us through? It reminds me of, I used to work for this professional development company and the main coach, the main speaker or leader, 
she used to ask our clients all the time. I get the fact that it's scary, but can you do it scared? Mm. It's that second type of fear that you're describing of, yes, it's causing some level of fear. Yes, it's causing some level of uncertainty. However, will you have the courage to take a step, even if those steps are laced with uncertainty, even if it is fearful, will you at least be willing to take a step? And I think yes. what people will find is that even when they are fearful, when they take a step, they either figure out what needs to be done or they recognize that the very thing that they feared never happened anyway. Right. Yeah. So you have to just do it anyway. Even if you're scared, can you, can you take a step even though you're scared? I get it. There's right. spirit associated with it, but will you push through anyway? Will you push that baby out? Um, I believe that sometimes that's one of the signs that you're on the right path and you're doing exactly what it is that the Lord would have you to do. Because right. if it didn't scare you a little bit, maybe it's not big enough. And in the God I serve, he, he does big things. Absolutely. No, I would love to, to share about that too. I think you're so right on in saying every bit of that. Um, I was just on a podcast interview where we were talking about fear and we were talking about moving through, moving through fear, but the idea that we want confidence, that's, yeah. we feel like that's our goal to move through fear. And she was saying, no, the, the goal is courage. Yes. Confidence begins to build after we've taken steps of courage in the presence of fear. And so many of us, when we get to the edge of fear and we think, I just need confidence and faith that I can do it. And it's like, no, you don't, you need courage that God is going to help you through it. That's what you need. You need courage to take the first step. And so, yeah, just not waiting for confidence and full assurance and 35,000 signs for it to happen, but saying, Lord, you've brought me here. I know you're going to show me the next step. And I know you're going to be with me as I take that step. So courage is really what we're looking for there. All of the things that we're taught to seek, mm -hmm. all the things that we think we need are so many of the things that would be nice to have that are not necessary. Right. Because you were describing that, I also think we do the same thing with clarity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is clarity good? Yeah. Do I like when there's clarity there? Absolutely. But right. do I 100% have to have clarity in order to be able to move forward? And I think the answer to that is no. And sometimes those things like clarity, and confidence and really thinking that we have all these things, they actually become an idol when no, all we need is courage. I often like to say, I'm sure Esther did not have confidence. I'm sure she didn't have clarity when she went before the king that could literally cut her head off, but she did have a plan and she did have courage. Yeah. So That's we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to take this conversation a little bit further and make sure that our leaders are fully equipped in this area. We'll be right back. God is commissioning women leaders to uphold Christian values and change the course of history for his glory and to mobilize other women to blaze the same trail. Want to know what type of kingdom leader you are? and learn specific strategies to impact change based on your type, find out by going to kingdomtrailblazerquiz.com right now. All right, so welcome back. Good stuff. We're talking about managing our emotions. We're talking about how the brain works in combination with, the, with what the Bible says. This is such good stuff. I'm so glad you're here. I knew this was gonna be great. So Alicia, as Christians, we sometimes have to have tough conversations, especially when we're trying to share Jesus, especially when we're taking a stand against a lot of the opposition that we see, the things that are trying to tear down the Christian values that we, you know, cherish so much. And so I'm curious, how have you learned to have tough conversations when it's pertaining to a difficult topic? Oh, this is so funny that you're asking me about this because I was just, I instantly thought of a conversation that I had this morning with my husband, who I was sharing something that happened with an interaction with one of my kids' coaches. And he's like, why did you tell her that she was rude when she said that? And blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, because I am not as confrontational as you are. Like, he'll just sit there and be like, you don't need to say that. And, blah, blah. and I'm like, 
So for, I mean, I feel like there's a spectrum of how to answer when we need to be confrontational and when we don't. Now that was just, that wasn't a principled morality kind of issue that I think you're referencing here. But I, it reminds me of the fact that everybody kind of has a different take on what that level is. For me, I feel like when we have things before us that are deal breakers in our faith or in the faith in general, we have to we have to bring them up. We have to take a stand for them. And so it's important to understand again, what's going on in our head, what might be getting in the way of that, which a lot of times is going to be fear of fear of man, probably specifically, and really being real before the Lord about that and, and understanding every time we try to put ourselves in that situation mentally, what are the thoughts that are coming up that are getting in the way of that forward movement in that area that he was calling us to do? So I think it's kind of an individual situation and depending on what it is, but we absolutely need to take that time to do the mindset work required to speak and let that confidence in who God says he is shine through. Um, for me, I'm someone who, again, who, who confrontation is not, it, I have to be pretty sure that God is calling me to, to speak out about something and also pretty confident that this is what I'm supposed to do before I will do that because that's, that's just not something I'm as strong in as a personality, but it's absolutely something, especially as the days get darker and we see these lines being drawn, we cannot be afraid to speak for truth and, and, uh, take a stand for what's right. And I also think as a result of listening to this conversation, you know, people are going to at least have done the work to make sure that they've learned how to properly manage their emotions, to make sure that they're not overthinking it, to make sure yeah. that they, they know whether or not this is a fear that they should retreat from or a fear that they should push through. Mm -hmm. And so you are just such a wealth of knowledge. There's so much more that people can learn from you. Where can they follow you on social media? So on social media, you could, probably the best place to follow me is on Instagram. It's at Alicia Michelle coach. And then there's also a free training that you can find on my site, which my site is called vibrantchristianliving.com. And that free training is vibrantchristianliving.com forward slash mind. And that training talks a little bit more about what we've been talking about today in terms of a lot of the patterns that we have around identity deal with feeling not enough, feeling like we're not worthy and we talk about in that training, how those patterns are formed on a subconscious level and how it's a lot of times we try to guess again in the church, try to say, well, we just need to believe that God says we're enough. We just need to believe these things. And it's, yes, we do need to believe that, but what is getting in the way of that subconsciously? That's what this training helps us understand what's happening subconsciously in our mind. So that when we heal from that, then God's word is not arguing with what's in our head. It's like, we can logically believe it, but when we have these subconscious patterns, we, we aren't going to move forward. So I would love to tell you more about that at the free training. And that's again, vibrantchristianliving.com forward slash mind. That is perfect. Y'all get that training, follow her on Instagram, get that free training, because I can guarantee you that this is just the tip of the iceberg of what it is that you know, need to know rather about this topic in order to lead effectively, especially in the challenging times that we are facing as Christians. So Alicia, Michelle, I am so glad that you were here today. Thank yeah. you for sharing your gems. Everyone share, share, share this episode far and wide. And I ask that you will go back and listen to previous and future episodes as well. Everyone have a great day. Bye-bye.